staying on this issue, the latest crime statistics have revealed that 294 attempted murder dockets involving children were opened from July to September. Let's discuss this further. We're joined by Luke Lemprecht from Women and Men Against Child Abuse. Luke, thanks for joining me tonight. The crime statistics get more and more alarming. What is it that we're doing wrong? Look, I think the first thing is that what these, uh, these crimes against children tell us is that we have very little regard for the dignity of the lives of children. And that really starts at the time when children are conceived. So children who are both unplanned and unwanted uh, are very, very at risk for being harmed. And the vast majority of the murder cases I've given evidence in, these children have been sort of, we call it death by installments. They've sort of been tortured to death over a period of time by their caregivers. And then obviously we've got the other cases which were highlighted in the media recently where people will, you know, abduct, uh, cut children to pieces, you know, where they have absolutely no regard for the, for the lives and dignity of children. And that speaks to people who care for them as well as the general population. So the 16 days of activism for no violence against women and children is observed annually, but it really seems to make little difference to the numbers. Do initiatives like this make a difference in the bigger scheme of things? Look, there, I think there's two ways to look at it. The first is that when you see an increase in crime statistics, for example, you see an increase in gender-based violence or child abuse or rape statistics, that's not always a bad thing because what happens is it shows that our public are reporting more. So the increase in statistics, you know, has not yet met the actual amount of abuse cases that we have. When it comes to something like murder, you know, and murder by people who abduct children or people who raise children in their homes. These campaigns have seem to have zero effect on how children are treated in their homes and from people who are predatory around children in the streets. So you've mentioned predators in homes. Now, something that is very alarming is that both men and women are perpetrators of violence against children. Why is this the case? I mean, we tend to think that men would be the primary perpetrators. One of the things we have to remember is that very often women are the only caregivers. So, for example, in the area I work in, you've got a sort of an absentee as a male, male rate of somewhere in the vicinity of close to 70%. So you've got uh, mothers who are in their homes. They, are, they have these children. The men have left them. Um, they feel that these children have been sort of an interruption to their lives and a burden to them. And they actually take out the violence and aggression on the child almost is like a, a surrogate for their feelings towards the men in society and their general sense of sort of dismay with the world. And they, they do it in very violent, aggressive ways. The other thing we saw a lot of in the cases that I gave evidence in was where the mother stood by and chose the men over the children. And that's a, that's a phenomenon that we see more and more, where it's almost like, the, and in many cases, it wasn't even that there was a financial dependence on the man. It was just that when this man came into their home, it's like their children, their children sort of stopped having a value to them uh, that was higher than the value of the man. And then they watched these men murder the, the, their own children. So we've spoken now extensively about the abusers, but what about the children themselves? What are the avenues or outlets for children who are in these abusive situations? Yeah, so the first thing is that the, the vast majority of the children that we've given evidence in are tiny children. So these are children who are infants, uh, toddlers, small children, and really they are totally, totally dependent on their parenting sort of, their parenting units, whatever those may look like. And as a result, unless neighbours and if these children are in any form of sort of early childhood development centre, ECD centres, clinics, um, creches, places that are the sort of social, the social parents of children, unless they start uh, watching and seeing what is going on, then there's nowhere for the children to go. The problem is, is that we've also had many cases where children are being cared for in creches and not being abused there as well. So, you know, we really have to, as a community, all keep our eyes on young children because they are enormously vulnerable to these kinds of crimes.
It's so heartbreaking to hear. Um, something else that we often hear is that children who come from such violent backgrounds often go on to perpetuate violence later in their lives. How do we go about breaking the cycle? Because it's vicious. So the, the technical term for it, we call it the war cycle, and you know we use the acronym WAR, which is World of Abnormal Rearing. And it's about the fact that you've got a combination of the fact that these children don't have attachment figures, so no one, no one has ever loved or cared for them, and those who were supposed to love and care for them have actually hurt them. Now, the only way to be able to intervene and rectify that is to have somebody in that child's life who can show them an alternative way of being in the world, whether those be teachers, sports coaches, um, you know, uh, classroom assistants in creches, other family members. They need to have an alternative script to see that this is not an inevitable way that the world sort of turns out when you have your own family. So it takes us looking after children initially to make them well and to repair the ruptures of their childhood. We pretty much need to repair them. And we always need to remember that we need to catch these um, cases early because um, a third of the children involved in these cases die. A third end up with long-term disabilities. And I'm talking about brain injury, cerebral palsy, and other mobility disorders, um, you know, and they're severely, severely disabled. Able then, and as a result, more at risk. And then a third of the children end up with huge um, the lifelong psychological and relational complications. So we, we, we want to raise healthy children, not repair broken adults where possible. So you've already mentioned the fact that as a community, it's our responsibility to keep an eye on children and how they're raised. But is there anything else that we as civil society can do to make a positive impact on the statistics? Okay, I think the first thing is we need to start looking at, for example, decent uh, sex education. There's been such an outcry about comprehensive sexuality education. We need to look at the fact that the, you know, we need to conceive children in mind before we conceive children in body so that we don't have unplanned, unwanted children wherever possible because that's, that's the worst start to anybody's life is to be both unplanned and unwanted. The other thing we can do is we can support our criminal justice system. For example, you know, I've been requested uh, to go next week to give evidence in a high court case as a member of society about what I think around sentencing. And I happily go to court because, you know, our, our justice system, when, when we fail to protect our children, we have to hold the accused accountable. And if we don't use the system that we have and we don't participate in the system, we can't. And if we can't do that, we can't have deterrence for people to not harm children. So, you know, my plea to people is, you know, as, as much as we bemoan the fact sure. that there's difficulties in our criminal justice system, we actually need to participate. Do you think enough is being done in the criminal justice system? So the criminal justice system, when it comes to cases involving very small children, is very complex. Because remember, the, the majority of the, well, all the evidence, short of, say, murder cases, um, all the evidence is given viva voce. case. In other words, the evidence has to be given via voice. Um, the person who's accused has the right to confront the accuser, which is the adversarial system we have. And small children who get hurt don't have that ability. They don't have the language ability. It's very difficult for them to give evidence. It's very difficult for them to withstand cross-examination, take the oath, etc. So they are inherently at a disadvantage in our criminal justice system. And when we protect children by, for example, removing them and placing them in care uh, through the children's court, the, the, the care facilities are often not adequate to care for the children properly. And then we have other issues where this idea of family preservation and family reunification has become almost an excuse to not intervene in the lives of families at all, even if those families are very, very dangerous. So, so I don't believe we are doing enough uh, for the small children. And when we've got when we've got very high-profile, complex murder cases where you've got post-mortems and you've got very good investigating officers and great state prosecutors, we're getting wonderful um you know, convictions and sentences, and the system is really doing its job well. But we don't want to constantly be prosecuting people for murdering their children. We want to stop the murder of children. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing all that insight with us, Luke. It's a pleasure. That was Luke Lamprecht from Women and Men Against Child Abuse, really reiterating that it does take a village to raise a child.